going to behave today. The camera is not going to, but my camera is just like tournamently not. Okay. Come on. All right, maybe I just need a new camera. We'll just have to deal with it. All right, let's see if this works here. Do I have an update? Yes, yes. All right, so uh, stream is live, camera is rebelling. Yeah, the camera's just gonna be what it is. So today is, I believe, April 2nd. We are in week 12 of CSE 598. And surprise, surprise, uh, we are now talking about kernel exploitation. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So, uh, as always, memes. This one, this one I felt, all right, guys? I've been trying real hard, but I, I felt this one, all right? Yes, before spring break, we had this beautiful, like, nice structured course, and everything was moving at a great pace, and we had these pre-recorded lectures, and everything was on time, but this is also the second iteration, right? You know how we get this first half? Somebody has to go through the second half. Uh, and and for, uh, for this material, you are the second half. Now, whenever this stuff gets taught again, you know what's gonna happen for uh, future learners? They're going to experience the full beautiful horse, all right? Because we'll have gone through these pain points. So, like, someone has to be the uh, the guinea pig, and this semester for this stuff, it is you. And I appreciate it. All right. Uh, in other news, somebody at least tried to pull down the dojo and like do some dev on it, and they have at least gotten a taste of our pain uh, and hopefully are a little bit more sympathetic to why things take as long as they do when they do. All right, so before yesterday, people were excited, right? We were gonna have this quarterly quiz thing, this big QQ, right? We've kind of been talking it up for a lot of the semester and people were excited about it's coming. Some people thought it was a joke. Uh, 365 thinks it's their homework. Right? Uh, some people that are looking at 466 think that, uh, you know, when the fall 466 comes, there's going to be like in person quizzes. People are very confused. Um, but this quarter of the quiz thing happened. Okay? Uh, they, this, this thing happened uh, yesterday. Now, after people looked at it, so like I said, some people thought it was an April Fool's joke because we happened to pick April 1st to launch this. Uh, but no, it is in fact real and there are real challenges. Uh, the reality is uh, there were two. Uh, modules released, okay? Uh, the first one is now listed under the Blue Belt material and it is listed as part of this course. The other one is listed in its own um, dojo called the Quarterly Quiz, if I remember right. The only thing that we have to deal with uh, for this class is this first module, all right? Uh, the kernel exploitation. The second one, this Cowbot FS, you're welcome to try and tackle it. We are not going to be discussing the uh, details of that. So some people thought that our material was gonna be like really easy, right? Well, this is that same person who uh, thought deving was gonna be super easy, uh, and then they tried it and they're like, wait a minute, how does any of this work? This is insane. Uh, the, the, the same person is like, oh yeah, this is gonna be easy, I'm gonna crush it. And then they looked at it and they're like, wait a minute, what? Like I've already, they, they started off with like, I've already seen this material and then they looked at the, the actual challenge and started working on it and realized that yes, this is going to take some time. Uh, and yes, since we we're revisiting the kernel, if you took 466 and you forgot how like uh, to do ioctal, that is going to come back and bite you. Fortunately, we should have time to do that at least one way uh, today. So what is this quarterly quiz thing? The quarterly quiz is a small set of like experimental uh, and purposely difficult challenges, right? This is for people, we are tar building this type of content for the people who have completed everything on the site and they want something new. They want something harder, right? It is not intended to be part of this class, right? They're their own challenges in their own separate dojo. It is supposed to be 
you drive yourself. Okay? It's not, we're going to build a whole bunch of educational material around it. It's meant to be something challenging and difficult you have to deal with on your own. Uh, it's released four times a year, so this is our first one. Like I said, it's supposed to be like a final boss, not part of the course. Now, with that said, I did say on the Discord the other day, maybe yesterday, that if anyone here manages to first blood it, I will give you some extra credit, right? Uh, because that would be very impressive. <laughs> Uh, like, I've looked at it and I'm like, okay, yeah, this would take me some time. Uh, so if you, if you crush it, prop, props to you. So uh, this was our schedule and where we were, except that's not what happened. So now we are on the revised, revised, revised schedule, uh, which I feel a lot more better about. I, I mentioned uh, before I started the stream that one of the things I said was this course is going to move at an insane pace until the students break. That is ultimately not what happened. Uh, what happened was we moved at an insane pace to where I broke because you guys solved stuff faster than I could, uh, you know, properly build out uh, stuff at an acceptable level. Uh, and so last week, the multi-host stuff got into a reasonable shape, but the quarterly quiz uh, material in this kernel exploitation stuff was at a fixed time. Uh, and so I didn't think it was fair to release that at you uh, knowing what was coming. And so instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna deal with the kernel exploitation stuff now and we'll come back and revisit the multi-host stuff at the end of the semester. Um, final, <laughs> I don't know what that link is. I'm not gonna click it. Okay, grades, there was no homework so nothing changed. These are just the same slides that were there before. Uh, logistics, if needed, this kernel exploitation module can run another week, right? It's planned for two weeks, we have that flex week. If we run through this and this is just something brutal, all right, we'll, bur we'll burn that flex week right here, okay? Uh, the goal is not to make something insane that you guys just ride the struggle bus on. Uh, real world binaries, you'll notice, is not on this schedule. So that is what got booted. It is what it is. All right. Demo plans, that's, that's all I got. We're gonna take a look at kernel heap. I had another slide, it's hidden. Um, and it has two things on it. First off, uh, this material was built out by Kyle Bott, who you may or may not know. He will be doing a office hours slash stream himself tomorrow at 4.30 on the Pwn College channel. So if you want to hear something straight from him, that would be a, a good thing to tune into. Second point, uh, there is a CSE 598 course that is listed in the fall. Uh, I believe it's CSE 598 Advanced Vulnerability Analysis, something something to that, something like that. Uh, that is being taught by Adam Dupay, uh, and it is not me, it is Adam Dupay, uh, and he will be teaching that course on Pwn College. So if you're looking for what is the next thing to kind of explore, uh, that's gonna be about um, finding and kind of discovering uh, vulnerabilities. A and it will be on Pwn College. I would highly recommend if you like this uh, type of stuff to check that out. Uh, what do we got? Nothing more. I'm good there. Wait, I'm scared? What are we scared of? We're scared to take this class next semester. You wouldn't take this class next semester because it's not taught uh, next semester. So uh, what are we doing? We are doing kernel exploitation. Now, something that is worth uh, mentioning right now, uh, the only slide deck you have is this right here. This slide deck is gonna get updated and you are gonna get some uh, recordings. There's nothing horrifically wrong there, uh, but I'm gonna split it out uh, a little bit further uh, with some demos. Now, what is insanely important for this module is the recommended reading. Uh, one of the like phenomena with heap stuff is heap stuff constantly changes, right? Uh, and so if you just Google general kernel heap stuff, you'll find a lot of misinformation or a lot of things that are like halfway correct and halfway not correct. Where these resources were handpicked by Kyle Bott himself who authored the challenges as these are the things that you absolutely should consume. Uh, so there is a reason 
specific to the challenges that these links are there. Uh, I will certainly try and incorporate the key points uh, into the slide material as it gets released here over the course of this week. Um, but if you are faster than me, that is where you want to be. Okay, so we'll start level one here. Hopefully this works. One of the um, interesting changes as of yesterday that I have not had the, the ability to verify because um, my dev setup is, is certainly different than prod right now. So I don't know if anything I do is going to work. What? Uh, we, we had to change the way the VM worked for reasons. So uh, let's SSH Hacker Dojo Pwn Doc College. Now I am not going to solve this, uh, but we are going to talk about the good old heap allocator. Or the Keep on the kernel. So, did anyone uh, have a chance to look at this slide deck? No? Yes? Kind of. Cool. So, uh, this is not going to be a complete regurgitation, but it's going to not make any sense uh, if I don't discuss what it is I'm showing you in the terminal, right? Because it's going to be like, what the heck is a slab, right? All right. So, uh, the Kernel uses a different type of allocator than what we've seen in user space or user land, right? In, in, us in user land, we had these like bin concept. It's completely different. So like everything that you think of over here from glibc heap doesn't apply, all right? And we don't even use the same words. Like everything has a different word. So like chunk is not a word we should be using when we're talking about this uh, kernel heap, right? So why why do we use a totally different uh, implementation? Uh, so the kernel has a lot of concerns that user land doesn't. The, the kernel has to be like insanely performant, it needs to be memory efficient, and it needs to avoid fragmentation. Right? Consider this scenario here, if I malloc uh, hex 80, I free it, then I malloc something 60. If we ignore the tcache, right, and we assume that we're going into the, the greater heap, uh, what's going to happen? We're going to take this free chunk, we're going to break it in half, and we're going to create a hex 20 um, chunk. Right? What happens if I just do this in a loop? I'm going to generate a bajillion hex 20 chunks that would never actually need to get used. And so this fragments and breaks up the memory that backs the heap, right? And that, that is okay or generally acceptable in user land. The kernel, however, needs to be robust and run in theory indefinitely, so we can't have these type of issues, right? So we can't use that same type of implementation. So they use something called the slab um, allocator. This is not an approved term. This is my term. Uh, this is from the official uh, kernel documentation as far as what does this thing look like. All right, your mental model should be there is this cache structure. A cache exists for a specific size. So there is a cache for size, I don't know, 128. There is a cache for size 256. But there are not only caches for specific sizes, but it is possible to create a cache for a specific, I'm gonna say kernel object, all right? So I can create a cache of size 108. That's a weird number. Why would you do that? Well, maybe there is some structure that is exactly 108 bytes that I know I'm gonna need a lot of. Right? So instead of using the 128 byte cache, I will create a cache that is hyper specific to my 108 byte struct. So a cache is specific to a size. These are not like bins. These are something that can be created. All right. Caches have slabs. A slab represents a region of memory that is, can be one page, can be multiple pages, but a region of memory that is going to support allocating these objects. Uh, this is not important for what we're going to do today. This is, so this, if we envision as a page, this is continuous, contiguous memory. So we start here, we go to here, 
Then we jump to here, we go to here, right? We got a page, it's 256 bytes. It turns out you can fit 16, uh, 256 byte slots in a uh, 4K page, right? So this 4K page could be what is backing the memory that's backing a slab. Does Punk College have slab support? Um, I don't know what you're asking. So we have this region of memory that consists of these slots of 256 bytes. These 256 byte slots are the regions of memory that get, would get returned by the allocator. Right? Now a cache doesn't have a slab, it has slabs. Which means that there are, can be more than one slab that is supporting a cache for a specific size. And there can be more than one cache for a given size. So there may be one cache, 428 bytes, that has 20 slabs. Each of these 20 slabs has two pages, maybe one has three pages, one has five pages, right? It, it, that's just, it is what it is. But that is the hierarchy of what we are working with. Cool. So there's this slab struct that points to this region of memory that is what is backing the slots. The cache can point to slab. We can look at this stuff. So let's do that. And this is where we can actually start. Otherwise, I'm like, ah, oh, here's some cool commands in the terminal, guys. So just check it out. OK. Now, for these commands, we do need to be in the good old VM. Now, the VM on these challenges, as this warns you up here, for technical reasons, we had to disable uh, some virtualization. So these VMs are going to be slow, like ridiculously slow. This is the, the, one of the changes that I mentioned that happened yesterday that definitely doesn't happen on, on my box uh, because I haven't done that change. Cool. So you actually probably can't directly do VM connect because the boot time of the VM will be so slow that the connect will time out. So definitely do VM start then do VM connect. All right. We are here. So if we can't proc slab info, is that big enough? Yeah. I get denied because I need to be root. That can't go. We get this beautiful printout. What is this? This is the listing of those caches. So you see that they have names. Now there are generic caches, and then there are, like I said, object or like structure specific caches. And we can see that from the name. So generally speaking, the name that, and this is just a hint, it doesn't have to mean anything, uh, the name relates to what the cache is for. So these generic, like kmalloc 512, this is a generic 512 byte cache that is just used for general purpose things. If you just call um, kmalloc, which is the equivalent of malloc but in the kernel, you're probably going to touch one of these. Right? But there are also object specific caches. Let's see, this one doesn't, I think I can touch it over here, outside the VM. We'll find out. Uh, slab info. What I'm looking for, yes. So one of the things that you may be familiar with is the task struct. You remember the task struct from 466? Well, it turns out the kernel makes a lot of task structs, right? Because there's a lot of things running. So there is a dedicated cache for the task struct. All task structs come from this. They don't come from the generic pool. They come from up here. 
Now, what are all of these, these amazing numbers? Well, if we scroll up to the top here, uh, we'll see the term is not allocation. The term is object. So how many active objects? This is how many objects are allocated from that cache. Number of objects is, is how many objects does the cache support? So if we see here, these are what, zero, zero, just show me something right here. Whatever this is, we have 207 allocated, but the, the cache can support 226 of whatever this thing is, right? And we can, we visualize that as this contiguous block of memory like this, right? Where some of them are allocated and others are not. It does not mean the first like three are allocated, right? And the last whatever are not, right? There's no, you can't assume anything about the ordering of the, the locations there uh, from here. Cool. Uh, we can also see uh, the, the number of slabs that are backing that cache. Uh, and that is hiding what, all the way over a second from the end here. So, and it will also tell us the number of, where is it, pages per slab. Pages per slab is before this colon. So this is eight pages, the top one here, eight pages that support this slab, right? There's eight pages per slab for this cache. And this cache has how many slabs? Uh, bam, uh, zero. But if we were to go down and find one, this one has a lot of them, uh, eight pages per slab uh, with that many slabs, right? So, so you hopefully kind of see how this relates. A little bit, of, uh, there's some faces. Cool. So what is my favorite tool to use? GDB, right? Uh, and, and so like when I'm trying to make sense of this, we, we, we GDB, right? Now, I'm not saying that this is going to help us because the, the kernel is uh, its own beautiful mess, right, uh, as far as complexity goes. But we have this, there's a couple other tools that are mentioned that format this data slightly differently. Um, there is so also something that's known as kernel, or not kernel, um, cache aliasing. So you can, just because these have a different name, they could actually be an alias for another cache. So we name it this, but it's actually backed by the same structures as another existing cache. Uh, and using the tools that are mentioned there, you can look at aliasing and kind of get an idea of what that looks like as well. Uh, not important for today, but just an interesting factoid. Cool. So we have caches that point to slabs. Which, which reference pages that are the blocks of memory. All right, let's GDB this thing. So we have challenge one. I'm not going to solve challenge one, but we are gonna use it for our purposes, uh, which means I will have to spoil a little bit of it. Uh, today, we shall use the binja. All right. So, we are, uh, if we looked at this challenge, what do we have? Uh, there's three things. Uh, there's a BZ image, there's a kernel module, and there is a VM Linux. So, is anyone familiar with these things? Yes. Anyone else? Eh, maybe. Cool. So, VM Linux, maybe. V is it going to tell me? Yes, it is just an ELF file, but it is a really big ELF file. Because you know what it is? It's the Linux kernel uh, as an ELF, right? And so if we look at, well, what happened when we ran uh, VM start? VM start fires up Kimu system, right? That, that is the virtual machine. And what it is, firing off here or running is that specific kernel. Now, these challenges all run on, and this is an important factoid. Uh, oh no, why am I blanking? 7.9? Uh, Bootlin. 
What is it? No, it's like 6.79. I'll see. I'll see it. I mean, we can find out real quick over here. We could just like go into the VM and look. Uh, 6.79. Yeah, I had the right numbers. I just had them in the wrong order. Uh, so if we are going to look at source code for this, this is very different than everything else, right? Very similar to how we had heap, where it had a different libc. These challenges have their own kernel <laughs> uh, because some of the things that we are going to look at are decisions that are made at kernel build time, right? Uh, and so that's why we have these different um, VM Linux. So if we're going to look at source, it would be 6.7, specifically 6.7.9. Right. Uh, which we will probably do at, at some point here. So make sure that you're doing that because the normal challenge environment uses uh, a tad bit older kernel uh, where things will not be as one would expect. Okay. Now, we have this kernel module. If we are in the VM over here, and we ls mod, we see the challenge module was loaded. Yes, so far so good. So, we look at this kernel module. What do we know about kernel modules? I'm going to have to brush off the, uh, the old kernel, kernel knowledge here from 466. What do I want to look at when I'm looking at a kernel module? What things am I interested in? So, okay, so, so we, we look for things like init module, right? This is what happens when it fires off here. And what we see, I don't know if I, can I make this bigger? I don't have the power. Hopefully it's big enough. Um, but what we see is at init, this challenge, level one, is going to open the flag. It's going to, looks like it's going to read it. Yeah, that, that, that feels, feels all right. Uh, it's then going to call chemmem or kmem cache create. What do you think kmem cache create does? It creates a KMM cache, boom, right? And, and so if that happened at init, and we cat, we have to sudo, sudo cat proc slab info, and we grep what is kheap object, is what this thing is being passed. Ooh, we see this cache exists. So this is a dedicated cache for, I'm going to spoil that for you. This is a dedicated cache in level one, specifically for these K heap objects, whatever, whatever they, they happen to be. All right. So that means anything that the kernel module does as far as allocating, as long as it references this, this cache, it will be allocating these um, objects. How big are they? 200. Or 200? Yes. What is it in not hex? Uh, five, two, one, three. Okay. That, 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 that's a good number because we see that right, right here. Right? That, that makes a lot more sense saying the number that's on the screen. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, okay. Cool. So, so we, we create this, this cache here, right? And we see that inside the VM. That's what happens at an end. Uh, what does this proc create? We've seen this before. Proc create k heap. Okay. I'm br brushing it off. Am I in the VM? Yes, I am. Look, there is our proc k heap, right? The kernel module's creating that file device inside of proc for us to interact with the kernel module. We've seen this pattern before, guys, right? Cool. What else am I interested in? I don't know. It could be too small. Uh, we have open. Right, that, that, that sounds like something. So if you'll recall, when we call open on the exposed kernel module device here, proc k heap, that's going to trigger this section of code inside the kernel module. What does it do when we open? It is calls kmem cache allocate, or alloc, specifies that cache that was created at init, and then this is just some flags values. Right here, this, this, this isn't a size, right? Because we already know the size. Why do we already know the size? 
something, something cash. Right, because a cash already defines a size, right? All right, so this is very different. The act of allocating from the cash, the size is already known, right? So the size is not determined by this argument. The size is determined by the cash that it is being uh, allocated from. Cool. So we get that right here. Uh, assuming that it doesn't uh, you know, blow up here, we're good, and we have this thing. And it should set it. And let's see. If it doesn't equal zero, so if we got a pointer, we're going to mem set it to zero. And uh, yeah, then we return. Now, what's ioctal doing? Remember ioctal? Ioctal was that amazing call that nobody can do, right? Because there's like 12 ways to do it, and nobody likes to write C, and doing it in Python is hard. And yeah, we're, we're, we're bringing him back. Um, you can use whatever approach you want. I'm going to use Python today. So, ioctal, what do we got? Uh, arg1, arg2, arg3. Does anyone remember what these are in ioctal? If not. Yes. So, uh, it is the file descriptor, the command number. Why does that not show there? Okay. Uh, yes, the command number and then the kind of uh, var args are getting passed in. Remember, everything is meaningless and made up. There is no definition unless you, you to like what these, how these are used until you read the code. So uh, we look down here. First thing it's going to do is call copy from user. It's going to print something. Uh, where does this show up, this print k? Yes, D message is the answer. So if anything is printed and you want to see it, dmessage is uh, a good place to look. It will not show to your standard out. It's going to call copy from user. What does copy from user do? Copies memory from user land into the kernel. So we got to make sure that we have this set up, right? Otherwise, we'll just blow up, right? If we don't satisfy this first constraint here, because that's the very first thing that it's going to do. After that, we, we start to look at what is the command number, what is the argument, and then deal with um, more complicated logic. For what I'm gonna run through today, we don't need to run through the entire thing. Any questions about what we saw so far? Should just be a refresher, boom. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure there is not a do.py and we will make a do.py. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at this data structure that I claim exists over here. This, this cache thing, all right? I'm gonna look at it in GDB. Because there's a bit more to it than this diagram. You'd think this diagram would have it all. It doesn't. And that's, that's uh, an official kernel resource. So, um, we vim do.py. Uh, what are you complaining about? Delete it. User bin env python3 from pwn import star. I'm going to go with python c types. Huh? Does anyone use this approach? No? I like this approach. It's, not, it's going to take forever on the VM because it's Python, but, but it's, it's clean to write. So uh, if I want to interact with uh, ioctl from Python, first thing I need to do is I need to open proc kheap, and we're going to open it uh, via read write. And that's going to be my file descriptor. I do believe you have to use OS open. You can't just use open directly because you want an actual file descriptor, not a Python file. You can probably pull a file descriptor out of a Python file, but that's not what we're doing today. Next, I need to use C types to get um, libc. Because I'm going to be calling not Python um, ioctl, because Python ioctl is cursed, in my opinion. 
right? Like it, it doesn't do what I want 99% of the time. But I can call into um, libc directly. So we will open this up with C types. We'll say libc equals cdll. Uh, this is at lib x80 this, that thing. And then libc so.6. Cool, so now I've got this libc thing. Now that I have this libc thing, I can go libc ioctl fd and then give it whatever I want. What was a, a number this was happy with? What? Five seven. Okay, five seven zero zero it is. And then over here, we'll just give it. I need to give it something. Hello world. Okay. So we could do that. But I want to look at something first. First we will look at what happens when we open. Uh, where was I? Why did this break? Oh no. Nice. Go password manager. In. Does this work? Yes. Okay. Sweet. Uh, the reason I want to look at call open a couple times is because I want to look at what happens here uh, when the allocation happens. Because what I want to look at is this cache thing, and I want to look at the um, data that backs it. Right? So we're going to call call the first alloc, and we'll put that right here. And we'll have a second one called second alloc. This will give us nice breakpoints. The other thing I want on my right hand side, we'll pull up VM debug. So we'll take a moment because we this kernel and all of these, as far as I'm aware, uh, have symbols. So this is good. This means we can like reference things. Uh, there are a couple super cool kind of globals that are mentioned right here. Um, KBM cache and slab cache. So if we were to just print, we get this pointer, uh, which we can uh, dereference as a KMEM cache. Okay. And now we have this beautiful KMEM cache, right? This is the, the highest order thing of this cache structure. Now, the thing that is not included in our beautiful diagram here is that this, what we just call cache right here, actually consists of multiple structures. It consists of the KMEM cache which is what we see here, which is the highest order thing. We also have a um, node level cache, which is what's listed down here. And then there is a CPU specific cache struct. The thing that is being used is the CPU specific cache struct. Because remember how we had tcache and it was um, thread specific, right? Well, that same problem exists in the kernel. Right? Well, what CPU is using what? We have multiple cores. How do we deal with contention? The answer is every CPU had for a given cache has a specific uh, kind of working set that it's, that it's dealing with. And everything down here, these are all um, node caches that reference slabs that are not being used by this CPU. It could be used by other CPUs, but it's not being used by this CPU. Right? And these could be slabs. This could be CPU caches, or I'm sorry, node caches that reference slabs that are partially used. They could be completely empty. They could be fully filled, right? There's no guarantee here about what we're looking at down there. And you're gonna say fully filled is not going to be used because the kernel can actually throw it away. And that is something that's true, right? 
but that isn't, as far as I'm aware, a guarantee, like that, uh, depending upon how you compile your kernel, like by default, you would be correct. Yes? Yep, I, I knew where that was going. Uh, so, <laughs> the, the point was is that there may be no full in here, but that is not something we need to deal with right now. Cool. So, if this is my highest level, all right, this right here doesn't tell me a whole lot, right? This is just a KMIM cache for KMIM cache. But I want the KMIM cache for this uh, K heap object, right? So, how are we going to get to that? Let's run our. We have to continue here. How do we get symbols? Pseudo cat uh, proc k all sims grep k heap. Because we saw in binja, these functions all began with k heap. So these are our functions. The one that we're interested in. Open. So. Go over here, go control C into GDB, let GDB have its sweet time. I uh, will set a breakpoint at that location, fire off. All right. So now we Python 3, our do.py, what should happen? Once we give it a little bit of time, this is what I mean when I say the VM is going to be a little bit slow. Uh, Somebody says, I don't have to import OS because it's already imported by pwn import star. I'm going to argue that explicit is better than implicit. Sweet. So uh, we hit our breakpoint. I am at the beginning of open inside of this right here. All right, we're in kheap open. However, we don't have uh, that knowledge right here, so I can't just print out. So instead, I'm going to dump out, say, 80 instructions at rip. Cool. We see here is our kmem cache alloc. If you remember from 466, stepping through the kernel is pain. Set breakpoints and continue until them. It is the way, guys. So we'll set a breakpoint at our new location. We fire off until we hit it. This pony bug. Yeah, okay. Now we are there. Now I am just past KMM cache alloc, right? So what should be in RAX? The, the, the address. Remember, return, val return values from functions, which this is uh, just a function, it's just getting called. Remember, we don't do syscalls from the kernel, right? Uh, not that this would be a syscall, but we're just calling something, so the return value is in RAX. And so if we print, RAX, that is my pointer that was returned from KMM cache alloc. Now, the first argument to KMM cache alloc we saw was the cache pointer. So this is a nice place to get RDI. This is my pointer to the cache for these kheap objects. If we do our same trick here, KMM cache star on RDI. We see the same struct, except now the name is kheap object. So we were looking at the struct for this particular um, object. You'll notice that there's less going on down here. No, it's because this is a less exciting guy. Now, I said that there's multiple uh, let's print this can I do yes all right what we have here hopefully does this look sane this looks sane uh, this is one of those node guys this is not what's being used. 
right? That these are the unused um, data. What we want to find is where is this actual memory? And we said this is CPU specific. And if you'll recall from like Windows land, remember when we had Windows land, we had this uh, kind of magic offset. Right? We got to do some, some magic voodoo, very similar to that. All right, uh, right here. Now this example will not get us exactly what we want. The important parts to pull this off is we get the current CPU, and then we use the current CPU to find the CPU offset, All right? And, and from there, once we have our CPU offset, we add that to this right here. This offset is from this CPU slab value gets added to the base address of CPU offset to tell us where the, uh, even though this is called CPU slab, it actually gets us to a KMEM CPU cache. Uh, so let's do that. Let's, let's follow the, the voodoo here. So I want CPU offset, and that is going to equal the per CPU offset, and we are going to index it by underscore thread minus one. Let's make sure that came off to something that looks reasonable. That looks reasonable as a base address. So I can now print the CPU offset plus this value right here without a comma. That should be a KMEM. Oh, now we're going to have to go to the source, guys. I don't think it's KMEM cache. Um, yeah, it's like KMEM CPU. Um, I have to remember what to cast it to. Uh, slab. Oop, where am I? Uh, slab common is okay. Is that defined? Yes. And we're on 679. Recall. Printing this stuff out in GDB is a little bit messy because there are unions, um, which is a bit of a shame. It is a KMM cache. No. Where am I? Yes, there's the struct. Show me this struct. Find slub. Slub def. We are slub. Okay. Came in cache CPU. Yeah, you may have you may have got me. Alright. KBIM cache CPU star. Uh, what are you mad at me for? Cool. So this is a very different looking struct. Right? This is the CPU um, specific KMM cache. This is what is being used right now. Now, even though we have this design here of Caches, slabs, pages, right? That's kind of our mental model. Uh, the slab doesn't necessarily hold the pointer to what we're interested in. It's stored right here. This free list, and the reason that this shows twice is because this is a union. You guys know what a C union is? Unions are crazy. Uh, unions are a block of memory that can be struct type A or struct type B. All right. And, and so GDB doesn't know what this region of memory is. So it says, hey, if it is this first thing, then it's this. If it's the second thing, then it looks like this. And that's why we see this value being repeated. And if we looked at the source here, inside KMM cache CPU, we see this is a union of either a simple struct or this free list, right? And you'll, you'll find this pattern quite a bit. And that's because the, that memory location could be used in two different contexts. 
But in both cases, this location is the free list. This is the next pointer. So if kmem alloc, or we didn't use, what do we use, kmem cache alloc. Uh, if kmem cache alloc were called again, this is the memory address that it would return. What was the address that was returned before? Still hanging out here in RAX. What do we notice about this? This is D00, and I'll highlight this so you can see it. This is D200. They are exactly hex 200 bytes next to each other. We don't have any like metadata. It is li literally as shown there, where these are right next to each other. No memory is wasted. Cool. So if I were to run uh, continue, we'll loop back to the second time I call open. My claim is this will be uh, the pointer that's returned. Now, when we think of um, list, how do I get to the next next thing? Well, it is a singly linked list, very similar to uh, how tcache works, right? And so you would initially think, well, we just look at the next pointer. It's going to be next, next. This is not the next pointer, right? That would be a trap. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll notice that these, these aren't very related. Uh, this, this particular challenge, uh, level one, does not randomize allocations, which is why we see um, REX was zero, or D00, and then we see D D200, right? This is going to be sequential in level one. Uh, I believe every level after does not have that property uh, because the kernel just doesn't have to give stuff to you in order, right? Uh, it, can, it can randomize that. So where is the next next? Plus 100? Yeah. I don't know that. You want 100 hex? Yeah. Why did you choose hex 100? Because when I read an article, there is not an idea to make a hardware. Uh, explain, explain the idea of hardware. OK, so you're a little bit ahead. Um, uh, he said that he looked at the kernel source. He found something that's called uh, free list hardening, which is a thing, and yes, you will have to deal with it. Uh, it is like tcache, um, or not um, tcache, safe linking. It's like safe, safe linking, except way messier, <laughs> uh, which is, is super cool, right? Uh, but this does not have that mitigation enabled. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to assume that you looked at that source and found, hey, that this is the memory location that it is messing with it. Now, is it always hex 100? Did you, did you find this as a constant? What did you see? Ah, see, now that is the key insight, right? You pull out this magic number out of nowhere. You're like, oh, yeah, it's hex 100. No, what happens if it's a small object? Hex 100 doesn't make sense, right? It's going to be whatever the size of the object is, halfway, right in the middle. Uh, since this is an object of hex 200 size, what's the midway point? Hex 100. Okay. So why do you think it's hex 100? It's harder, it's harder to mess it up, right? We, we saw this in uh, Tcache when we have the next pointer right immediately there. It's a slight buffer overflow, has a, will immediately corrupt that next pointer, right, and cause problems. If we have this whole hex 200 region to, to mess around with, why not put it in the middle? So it's, it's least likely to get interrupted from just shenanigans in general. So that, that's, that's the Raymond reason. So then this is my next pointer, or my next, next pointer. Where's my next, next, next pointer? Yeah, right, yeah, it, it should be like, yeah, you just told this guy, come on, right? Like, I, I want it, uh, oh, I'm a liar. Oh no, why am I a liar? 
I don't know. That's going to have to be a, a great Kyle mystery. Uh, because it should be. You want to print the whole thing and see it? Uh, 200 giant hex is what? Uh, 20, 40, 40 giant hex? Uh, oh, yeah. No, they, no, no, this is the one we want. So, where am I? Here. This one. Oh, I know what you're saying. It, but I don't think that's the case. Um, examine 40 giant hex. Yeah, it has... It has something going on. OK. I have no idea what that is. That. All right. Halfway in the, in the middle of the, so. But it looks like the, the, the number is less because the size is, is shorter. And there is a lid or three lids. I don't know. It should be halfway in. Because it okay. looks like you know what we're going to do? We're going to continue here. We're going to march onward. <laughs> we're not going to go down this rabbit hole because we're already out of time. Uh, but what we will do is we will continue onward until we hit our next break point. And we'll print our AX. And we will see that, that the, the first one is what, what I said it would be. All right. Uh, so then let's see what actually ended up there. Because right? now we've done that allocation. So we should be able to uh, look at this guy. Now it's there. That is what got returned, right? Uh, where am I? Hex 200 plus. Oh, what have I done? Telling you is how this works. What did I what did I muck about here? We go to the CPU cache, that's gonna be the current guy, which then has this pointer, which is what gets returned. Right. Okay, now I'm past it. So I oh I had the other breakpoint. So I wasn't where I thought I was. Okay. All right. Things work, the world makes sense, guys. It's a good day. Okay. Uh, and so now we have that. Now if I go back and look at the uh, KMM cache CPU, this was the value that was there. D400 is what got pulled next next. And if we scroll up, I'm just curious now. How, where did it come from? Because there's no hardening, it doesn't randomize it? Yeah, just the standard port report. I guess that, that, that makes sense. Um, or it's not, it's not the hardening, it would be the... Um, so uh, as a quick preview, because if you make it past level one, you'll have to deal with it. There's three things that you'll have to deal with. Uh, the first one that was mentioned is free list hardened, right? That is what he keeps saying, but is not what I think he is actually referring to. Uh, this is the different math, uh, similar to um, safe linking. So instead of just XORing the pointer uh, with the value that's at the pointer, we also have this random factor. There is a random value that is also XORed into this. Uh, and we see that this random value is a property of the KMM cache. So, if we wanted to like fully reverse that, we'd have to not only know the pointer and where it is, but we also have to know this random value, right? There, there, there's another uh, piece in the mix. I, I don't want to go into that, right? Like, like, like I'm, already, I'm already past time here. Uh, this is uh, what I believe we were talking about here, uh, which is uh, the free list randomization. So level one, I said there's no randomization, right? And so we saw it was D00, D200, next one, 
You want to guess what it would be? D400, right? Woo, big surprise. Uh, however, <laughs> um, I, I believe every other challenge uh, has this free list randomization enabled. Uh, what happens here is it randomizes the order of the chunk. They're not bad word. Objects, right? It, 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 it randomizes the order of the slots that are used to return objects. So if these two slots were already allocated, and we, they're using objects, and we call, uh, like came in cache alloc or came alloc again, then the next location that gets returned is random. Now, this is randomized when the cache is created. This is an important thing to keep in mind. This is randomized when the cache is created. So if you free something, then you allocate it to the same, the same order? That's a, it's a deep thought. It's a deep thought there, sir. <laughs> the, the question is, well, what happens if I like allocate some stuff and then free it? Like, how does that work? Because it's a singly linked list, I said. And how do singly linked lists work as a data structure? Right? Good thought, good thought. Uh, and so our theory here is if I were to fire up another one, uh, we would see that these next pointers uh, could be chained along the way uh, because the locations have to be randomized. Right? Well, you, you kept saying uh, free list hardened, but free list hardened is the, the XOR craziness. Right? But it should be, you would have to know where the next thing is if it's randomized, right? So, so there would have to be a next point if I'm randomizing the slots, the order of the slots being used. I don't know that for a fact, right? I haven't like looked at it, but if we think about how this like. Oh, uh, I can't imagine this type of workflow that's a trap. I don't know, I'm not going there. Okay, I'm, go I'm going somewhere else. So another thing, that, <laughs> the third mitigation that you will have to learn about, that is a trap, sir, um, <laughs> is, is the hardened uh, user copy. So uh, if you'll recall, how does data get moved from kernel to user land? Generally speaking, uh, we use uh, copy from user, copy to user, right? That's what you, we see uh, in our module somewhere down here in IOCTL we see copy from user and then uh, we copy to user, right? That's how we hopefully safely move stuff back and forth. Uh, well, the kernel heap also supports this concept of hardening the um, heap data that is used here. And so a cache can know what subset of the object can be copied from the kernel to user land. And it, it knows this by two values. There is an offset, which is the offset into the object where we can begin to copy. And then there is a, I probably have that back. No, I'm gonna trust this. I'm gonna trust that I did this right. But these two values are used. Uh, the offset, one of them is the distance from the beginning of the object to where you're allowed to copy. The other one is the region of memory, the size, the size or length from that point that can be copied. And so what this allows is for there to be a kernel object that is bigger and has values that are like internal kernel things. And we protect the scenario of the kernel copying these things that are supposed to be internal back into user land. So in the event that this protection, this hardened uh, user copy is enabled, then when copy from user copy to user is used, this is checked against to make sure that we are within the safe area of that. All right, with that, I am definitely over time. Does anyone have anything for me? Question? Yes. So there, there is, there are things that can help you. They aren't installed on the dojo. Um, I'll consider adding them. Um, well, 
Like if, what is it, LX symbols? I remember that. Uh, yes. Um, the trick here is there are, there's two things. There's LX symbols, which is something that's compiled by the kernel, and then there is another magic Python plugin that I have to take a look at still to see if I want to include it or not. I don't like magic tools, man, <laughs> right? Like, I really don't. Uh, and it, this is a me thing, not like a phone college thing. Uh, like, I think it's very valuable to understand this. And you're like, okay, well, I don't want to type these like thousand commands every time, Robert, right? It's a, it's a reasonable request. You know what you could do? You could take those commands and script it into a function and then just call it from GDB, right? Um, I'll look at it and consider it, um, adding tools that will help you in that regard. Uh, but right now, they are not installed. So this is so like what you get. As far as I'm aware, no. I like there, there are external things that we could include that would enable um, you to mess about there. Uh, similarly, one of the things that you will have to do in this module that hopefully is not a spoiler um, is like, Rob, this isn't just heap, right? Very similar to when we had user land heap. We did some heap thing and then we did something with it, right? Uh, well, that also exists here. Um, and so while I'm way past time, hopefully Kyle will have time to discuss some of the other factors that are specific to, for instance, ropping in the kernel, right? Because in 466, we talked about SMAP. We talked about SMAP. We did not have challenges that dealt with these. So you may have like, oh yeah, I heard that word. Well, now it's going to prevent you from doing certain things because you have to actually interact with it. Uh, and so hopefully Kyle will have time to hit those tomorrow. Um, it will definitely be discussed in the pre-recorded stuff once I get to it. Uh, tomorrow at 4.30 is the Kylebot Bonanza, right? Uh, where he has spent many a year um, in the kernel uh, and is definitely uh, more knowledgeable than me. Uh, let me double check Twitch, anything else? Uh, nothing, things are great, I love it. All right, with that I will leave you all. Uh, goodbye and good luck. <laughs>